Hello, welcome to uh, the Rockford Reading Podcast, Rockford Reading Daily Podcast. I think that's what we'll name it. Welcome to the Rockford Reading Daily Podcast. This is a podcast presented to you by the May 30th Alliance Podcast Network. Uh, my name is Leslie Roth, and I'm a member of the May 30th Alliance. Uh, this specific podcast series is going to be centered around reading a different piece of literature uh, and releasing a, uh, the reading of a different piece of literature uh, every day. I'm going to try to keep the podcast episodes between 30 to 40 minutes long. Uh, some days, if we get enough of a backlog, we may start to release multiple at a time uh, to get through the books. Uh, but the main point that we want to do this for, well, the multi multiple reasons we want to be doing this. Uh, one of them is we want to provide the opportunity every day for somebody to begin their journey uh, on the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And we believe that uh, putting out a, what up, what up, putting out a, a piece of literature or putting out audio of uh, the reading and the comprehending and the dialogue around a piece of literature every day provides the opportunity. And then also there it provides the opportunity for someone to further the journey that they're already on to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Uh, and, and also we want to uh, begin to provide alternative uh, mediums. And so the Social Construct of Leslie podcast is a podcast that we have, a podcast series that we have coming out on Sundays and Thursdays. I would uh, implore people to take time to listen to that podcast series. Uh, it's me going back and speaking about my journey through the movement to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in Winnebago County dating back from May 30th. And then every episode, I get closer and closer to where we sit currently in this struggle in 2021 October uh, this podcast series will be uh, different people reading different pieces of literature uh, again 30 to 40 minutes long dissecting what they're reading in the pieces of literature uh, we have uh, the leaderless by Ari Perez podcast that has multiple episodes out and so we just want to and Get, continue to uh, provide different mediums and so this is the beginning of providing another medium uh, the plan is to have to get create re, to create and record a uh, backlog of these and then we can get in a place where we can start releasing these daily uh, to the public so I'm not sure what date you'll be re receiving this first one but we are going to begin by reading have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. I've read portions of this book before, but I have not read it in its entirety. So uh, we're going to take down, we're going to go down this journey together. And for anybody who may have not had any uh, interaction with our Rockford reading series, what we do is we read a piece of literature and then in that piece of li while reading that piece of literature, we speak on how it correlates to the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in Winnebago County. How we can take uh, tactics or ideologies or philosophies that are mentioned in the literature and apply those to the struggle that we are currently waging. So we don't want to just be reading this or listening to this just to say that we read it or that we listened to it. We want to be reading it or listening to it and retaining information from it and learning from it. So I'm going to do my best to uh, guide us on that. Here we go. Page one, chapter one, have black lives ever mattered? Have Black Lives Ever Mattered? An Introduction. Does the title of this work seem provocative? If so, then good. That's how it's intended to be. For if the question is provocative, then what of the answer? Is not the answer, no matter how damning, far more provocative? And yet, who dares answer in any other way than the negative? There is an old axiom, especially among journalists and journalism professors, that, quote, today's newspapers are the first draft of history, end quote. Like most axioms, they hold a kernel of truth, but there is more. Here is another axiom, quote, history is written by the victors, end quote. The words printed here were not written by a victor, but by one who has seen and sensed what was happening on the other side of a prison wall, who seeks to convey those impressions with truth 
and who has often done so several times a week. In a sense, the impressions recorded in the pages ahead are a form of history, black history, recorded during a particular passage of time. During this particular period, we experienced the greatest economic disaster since the Great Depression of the 1930s, the cultural dominance of hip-hop, the nation's fever over mass incarceration, the Obama presidency, the spread of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the unexpected onset of the Donald J. Trump era. True history, what Howard Zinn called, quote, the people's history, end quote, is the one that ordinary people create through their everyday struggles. And yet, for blacks, much that never makes it to the newspapers, or, if so, only in a distorted form, still leaves scars in the mind, evidence of trauma sustained from simply existing as a black person in the United States of America. The pages ahead reflect the people's struggles in the invisible sectors of American society, sectors which, by a terrible necessity, are populated largely by blacks, Latinos, immigrants, the incarcerated, and those with little income. The pages ahead are also, by equal necessity, reflections of insurgent, emergent, radical, and revolutionary aspiration, thinking, and living. For from oppression comes solidarity, resistance, rebellion, and change. National movements like Black Lives Matter are manifestations of such solidarity and resistance and give voice to the eruption of outrage, angst, hopes, and the surge of protests provoked by each new killing. That such a movement was brought into being by three young women of color, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tomate, and Alicia Garza, is telling, for throughout American history we have seen how the dedicated efforts of women of color have driven resistance networks and liberation movements. These determined sisters have both studied history and altered it, and continue to do so today. Hold on, let me get, I gotta get a drink of water, my fault. Okay. The American nation states began with Europeans brutally dominating and enslaving indigenous people. The land seized in, quote, the New World, end quote, were worked by so-called, quote, Indians, end quote, people whose lives did not matter to the white Europeans who, quite literally, worked the locals to death. In his chilling portrait of the, quote, American Holocaust, end quote, historian David E. Standard quotes from the writings of Bartolome de las Casas, the Franciscan friar who accompanied Christopher Columbus on his trek to, quote, the Indies, end quote, caring only for short term material, excuse me, caring only for short term material wealth that could be wrenched up from the earth. The Spanish overlords on Hispaniola, Hispaniola removed their slaves to unfamiliar locales, quote, the roads to the mines were like ant hills, end quote, Las Casas recalled deprived them of food, and forced them to work until they dropped. At the mines and fields in which they labored, the Indians were herded together under the supervision of Spanish overseers, known as mineros in the mines and estancerios on the plantations, who, quote, treated the Indians with such rigor and inhumanity that they seemed the very ministers of hell, driving them day and night with beatings, kicks, lashes, and blows, and calling them no sweeter names than dogs, end quote. And so I want to take a moment here to point out uh, something that I, I seen on Twitter recently, and it was a tweet of uh, a, group of, a group of people uh, that were working for a company, and they were all going on strike, and they were listing some of the things that was the main reasons that they were going on strike and that they wanted to be addressed. And one of them was the extended workload that they had throughout the week. They had worked uh, months on end with mandatory overtime, with mandatory uh, six-day, seven-day work weeks. Uh, and one of the things that somebody retweeted, at, they tweet, retweeted this tweet that had all of these things in it, and they said, uh, are you surprised uh, the American labor system was literally 
founded on slavery, literally created on slavery. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we forget because of how far down in the society we have come or how far down in history we have came is that so many of the things that are normalized to us or so many of the things that we considered uh, to be just business as usual or the society as usual are things that were created on uh, 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 evils or created on uh, corruptness or created on uh, 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 exploitative ideologies. And so uh, when you look back and you think about the first people to ever uh, hold, hold, be the be a labor force in America. Uh, the first pe- the first labor force here were uh, slaves, were people who were enslaved, and there are different categories of people who dealt with uh, slavery. Uh, and even if you can uh, add indentured servitude into the slavery, because uh, even though indentured servitude was not the same as chattel slavery was, and it was not the same thing that the indigenous people went through, uh, part of the indentured servitude uh, was still exploitative uh, was still oppressive and so the first labor force in this system the first workforce in this system uh, the first workforce in the system the first labor force in this country the first workforce in this country uh, was one of slaves and so when you start from such a, a corrupt beginning it's no surprise that so few people Uh, can work and maintain a livable wage just with one job. Uh, The society was never created in that way. The uh, country was never meant, was never built in that way. Uh, So I think it's, you know, it's an important point to point out. So savage was the violence that, okay, we're picking back up on page three. Sorry. So savage was the violence that the Europeans waged against the people of the indigenous nations that before a century passed, Approximately 60 to 80 million Native Americans have been killed. Indian lives simply did not matter to whites who arrived on their shores. What mattered to them was getting free land and cheap labor. By 1502, the Spanish were importing shackled Africans to replace the Indian communities that they had brutally decimated with abuse and disease. By 1619, the first black laborers, known as indentured servants, arrived aboard Dutch ships at Jamestown, Virginia, an early English settlement. By 1650, the norm for black people in the growing colonies would be a lifetime of enslavement. For the next 200 years, black lives mattered as little to whites as had those of the indigenous. From 1619 to the early 1800s, some 100 million people were transported in filth and chains from Africa to the Americas, with a relatively small number, nearly a million, being shipped to the plantations and fields of British North America. These dark-skinned Africans and their descendants slaved for generations in order to feed, house, serve, and enrich profit-obsessed white people. They wasted their lives to build a thriving economy that enriched their enslavers, but not themselves or their families. And th- and that is one of the things that uh, uh, that is one of the things that I think is important to again point out about uh, the society that we live in even today. And uh, that is one of the things that most people in the workforce in this capitalistic system in this capitalistic society deals with, uh, and that is. Uh, The work that you are doing, the labor that you are uh, uh, putting forth, the toil that you are putting forth on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis uh, usually uh, benefits people higher up than you more than it benefits you. And usually you are the one that is that are uh, doing more of the manual work or more of the uh, time consuming work or doing the things that are the most uh, necessary uh, to continue a system on and continue the system for working. And so uh, the people who uh, work at the McDonald's or the people who work at the Target and who are there daily dealing with the customers every day or stocking the shelves every day or uh, uh, cooking the food every day, uh, they are making the least amount of money from the business and the system that is McDonald's or the business and the system that is Target in. Uh, it's the higher up you go, the people are making more uh, money off of those things. It's not being equally dispersed. And the work isn't being equally dispersed either. But even if the work was being equally dispersed, uh, you still aren't getting the equal uh, residual effects from it or the equal residual benefits from it. And again, the, that is, uh, those are the 
uh, residual effects of slavery. Slavery was the first uh, business model here, was the first uh, capital, you know, for capitalistic model here. You know, the first Jeff Bezos was a slaveholder. The first, uh, you know, I want to get into the weeds, but just keep that in mind. So let's keep reading. These first black Americans weren't considered enslaved workers. Under British and American law, they were not even persons, but property, mere beasts of burden. In the 1856 book, Shroud Slave Laws, a sketch of the laws relating to slavery in the United States of America, George M. Shroud surveys the laws governing the impoverished lives of enslaved blacks and portrays white America as a place of unremitting cruelty and meanness. Shroud shows how the courts of the land, north and south, served the interests of the white enslavers, but was utterly ruthless when it came to the needs of the blacks they enslaved. Among the cases that Stroud presents to crystallize his points are Negro Flora versus Joseph Grosberry and State versus Man. In the case of Negro Flora versus Joseph Grosberry, Miss Flora, a black woman enslaved in Pennsylvania, attempted to use the court system to sue for her freedom. In what Shroud calls a, quote, mockery of justice, end quote, the state's highest court ruled that slavery did not violate the state constitution, even though it states, quote, all men are born equally free and independent and have certain inherent and indefeasible, inexpungible rights, among which are those of enjoying and defending life and liberty, end quote. Shroud, a Philadelphia attorney, noted with derision that the, that the decision was rendered by a unanimous state Supreme Court. In the case of the state versus man, the decision reads, quote, The end of slavery is the profit of the master, his security, and the public safety. The subject is one doomed in his own person and his posterity to live without knowledge and without the capacity to make anything his own and to toil that another may reap the fruits. Such services can only be expected for one who has no will of his own, who surrenders his will in an implicit obedience to that of another. The power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. In the actual condition of things, it must be so. There is no remedy. The discipline belongs to the state of slavery. They cannot be disunited without abrogating at once the rights of the master and absolving the slave of his subjection. It constitutes the curse of slavery to both the bond and free portions of the population, but it is inherited in the relation of master and slave. Some readers may object and ask, Supreme Court opinions from two states? How does that reflect the broad diversity of American legal opinion? Or isn't it unfair to cite to cases before the Civil War before the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. While these objections have facial appeal, they do not stand scrutiny, for it remains a fact of legal life that most law is state law. Furthermore, most cases never make it to a state Supreme Court. Moreover, what changed after the U.S. Constitution was amended? In a word, little, for Southern states followed the bright, brief respite of reconstruction with the dark night of redemption and proceeded with the tacit acquiescence of the U.S. Supreme Court to ignore the so-called, quote, reconstruction amendments, end quote. This was accomplished first by attacking black voting rights, then attacking black voters and using state laws and state constitutions to outlaw black voting. If the U.S. Constitution was respected in the South, why did Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and company have to struggle for voting rights or even need a voting rights law? Why was the civil rights movement even waged? Because across America, black lives, as with black votes, didn't matter. Or did they? During Reconstruction, blacks were elected to state and national legislative bodies. They sat on juries and served as government officials. Perhaps more potently, Black political figures shepherded into existence free public schools and public works and advanced women's rights. The new public schools, open to black and white children, brought literacy to millions for whom it might otherwise not have been possible. Of course, white reaction took the form of denigration of black politicians, 
perhaps best seen in the propaganda film for white supremacy, Birth of a Nation, which has the distinction of being the first motion picture to be shown in the White House. President Woodrow Wilson described the film as, quote, like writing history with lightning, end quote. Quote, my only regret, end quote, said Wilson, quote, is that it is all too terribly true, end quote. Uh, and I think we're, I want to interject there and because it's a lot of things that were pointed out uh, as we're going through this timeline of American history. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things I guess that'll be the first thing I point out is uh, uh, and in, uh, for an understanding of police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice as it exists in Winnebago County and as it exists in, as a greater whole in this nation, uh, it is important to be a, a student of history. It is important to uh, know where we have came from, to understand the roots of where these things originate and the roots of police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice uh, trace back to uh, uh, the colonization of, uh, of America, the colonization of, of Africa. It traces back to uh, uh, it traces back to the uh, genocide of the indigenous people uh, in, in the Americas, uh, in the land that we call America. It traces back to the enslavement of the Africans uh, and the subjugation of, uh, of all people of color and the, uh, the dehumanization of people of color. And once you see how far back these, these things go and how how they have altered the way that they look, but how they have not been absolved out of the society, uh, that is when you can get a true understanding of the gravity and the nature. And when you can, uh, and one of the things that I have been able to do, the more often I go back and have these history lessons or walk through history and walk through American history, whether it be through uh, quickly, as is sort of being done in this first introduction here, or a book that slowly takes you through it, uh, I can uh, each time pick up something new uh, and, uh, uh, pick up a different trail or a different ideology that led us to the place that we're at currently. And so I think that that's one of the things that's important about reading these books and uh, going back through history and time. Uh, I think that Reconstruction specifically, hold on. Now, I believe Reconstruction specifically is something that is uh, not touched on or spoken about enough in um, uh, mainstream society and in mainstream history and in mainstream education. And so uh, I'm happy that Reconstruction was sort of touched on here. Uh, and again, the question that continues to be raised is as we go through and look at all these things that have happened to people uh, who are black and to uh, uh, people of color in this society, uh, the question of have black lives ever mattered uh, becomes a, 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 ra a more a, a echo, you know, a sort of it echoes through, through history and through time. But let this motorcycle go past. We outside. We outside. We were, we outside. Okay. <clears throat> The beginning of the 20th century was marked by horrific racist mob attacks on blacks from the rural South, who, in many cases, were newcomers to America's major cities. Black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois called the period, quote, Red Summer, end quote, for the sheer volume of black bloodshed. An American Congress had indeed passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but they were blatantly ignored in dozens of states where the torture and terrorism of bull whips, lynch rope, and arson were practiced with greater consistency than were the lofty promises of the amended Constitution. Yes, in theory, the U.S. Constitution protected the rights of black Americans to vote. But southern states responded by producing a plethora of new laws to suppress black voting, such as poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses. Laws that denied the right of voting to anyone whose grandfather hadn't voted. Have black votes ever mattered? Well, they certainly have seemed important enough to suppress and steal. The naked denial of constitutional rights for perhaps a century lasted until the civil rights and black liberation movements demanded change. Meanwhile, Millions of black people voted with their feet when they left the South for states in the North and West, including Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kansas, and California. 
This exodus became known as the Great Migration, one of the biggest population shifts of the 20th century. Black Americans fled the ephemeral Southern comforts for the reasons people have immigrated since time immemorial, to escape the acute meanness of racial tyranny, to escape terrorist violence, to flee from economic exploitation, to seek lives of freedom and dignity, and to bless their children with hopes of better lives. Historian James R. Grossman writes of the new period for black life in America this. For the first time in American history, the nation's basic industries offered production jobs to African Americans. From New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, to Pittsburgh, Chicago, Detroit, and to a lesser extent, Los Angeles, factory gates opened. Working railroad yards, steel mills, fruit processing plants, garment shops, and other industries paid wages far beyond what was available in the rural or urban South. But it was more than the money that attracted black Southerners North. These jobs also represented portals into the industrial economy. These opportunities promised a new basis for claims to full citizenship, a promise that a previous generation of black Southerners had envisioned in the possibility of land ownership. For these Americans, the North was the promised land and they did not see the thorns and miss the roses. They never dreamed that the new gleaming mega cities would become traps as oppressive as the ramshackle huts and shacks they fled from back home. They went north and west because their black lives mattered. But where once whites killed and terrorized from beneath the KKK hood, now they now did so openly from behind a little badge. And while it may seem like a leap to associate the historical white terrorism of the South with the impunity with which police kill in black communities today, it is really not so great of a leap because both demonstrate a purpose of containment, repression, and the demunition of black hope, black aspirations, and black life. Indeed, the late Dr. Huey P. Newton, a co-founder of the Black Panther Party in a 1967-era interview, likened the relations between the police and blacks in the United States as one of antagonism similar to that between the U.S. Army and the enemy population in Vietnam. Quote from Huey Newton. In America, black people are treated very much as the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people. For the brutalizing police in our community occupy our area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. And the police are and our community not to promote our welfare for our society or for our security or for our safety. They're there to contain us, to brutalize us and murder us because their orders are to do so. And just like the soldiers in Vietnam have their orders to destroy the Vietnamese people, the police in our community couldn't possibly be there to protect our property because we own no property. They couldn't possibly be there to see that we receive due process of law for the simple reason that the police themselves deny us the due process of law. And so it's very apparent that they are only in our community, not for our security, but for the security of the business owners in the community and only to see that the status quo is kept intact. End quote from Huey Newton. Dr. Huey P. Newton was quite clear in revealing what mattered to police and the power structure they serve. Black lives did not matter to them in the mid-1960s, and they seem not to matter to them today. When black men, women, and children gathered in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri to protest the police killing of Mike Brown, they were met by flanks of militarized forces armed with weapons of war. What has really changed? Did things improve under Barack Obama? How do you think things are going under Donald Trump? Have black lives ever mattered? Uh, and so... That brings us to the end of introduction, the end of the introduction of Have Black Lives Ever Mattered? And that brings us to the beginning of the first chapter, which is entitled Hate Crimes. Let me see where we're at here on the time. And we're arriving right on the 30 minute marker. So what I'm going to do is give some closing thoughts and then I will wrap episode one of Rockford Reading Daily up. And I'm going to begin right away on episode two. Uh, you will get episode two at least 24 hours between episode from episode one. Uh, and other people will, you know, be able to hear it right away, depending on when they listen. 
So let's see. The first thing that I take away from that introduction is the importance of the phrase and the statement black lives matter and the importance of, uh, of us having a conversation about have black lives ever mattered. And I think that the, the answer to that question is no, that they have not ever mattered in this country. They have not ever mattered in this society. Uh, now has a black life singularly has a black life mattered? Yes. But black lives collectively, black lives wholly, black lives as a community uh, have not ever mattered. And uh, and as is pointed out here, uh, the 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 beginning of the relationship of black lives with this society, with this country, uh, begins with uh, enslavement. Uh, The beginning of the relationship with lives of color and people of color with this country and with the society begins with genocide. uh, the same thing is, was pointed out as well. The workforce, when we when we think about how uh, unjust and inhumane the the labor force is here, or the you know how employment and and you know just in general labor basically is here. Uh, when you re- when you take the time to think about how labor in this country began with enslavement, began with indentured servitude, which is you know the most uh, unjust form of labor that can exist in my opinion uh, you understand why we have such an unjust labor system because we've been trying to because it started so low when the bar is set so low uh, it's no wonder why it has you know we're still so far behind and that's one of the things that I points out to me and I, I, I think about from that first section that we read and uh I think one of the other things that I points out is uh, I think about the president, Woodrow Wilson, I believe. Yeah, it was Woodrow Wilson uh, watching the birth of a nation in the White House. And that's something that I've seen in documentaries and heard people talk about in documentaries and I've read in books as well. And for people who may not know, the birth of a nation was uh, this movie that basically cast the Ku Klux Klan as American heroes and uh, had white people in blackface and a bunch of lynchings. It's just a, a racist film. And so the fact that the president was watching this in the White House and uh, lauding the film, and it was the first film ever watched and seen in the White House, again, it lets you know where the roots of of our society uh, traces back to what the roots of these institutions trace back to. Uh, and, and that's why we, and we have to do the job of, of adequately addressing and being honest about these things. And so I think one of the things that has happened far too often is that Donald Trump has been made to be some outlier in presidential history. And uh, there are very specific things about Donald Trump that uh, are not, that are unique to him. Uh, but racism is not something that is unique to Donald Trump. Uh, there are there were every res- president before Donald Trump was racist. Uh, and the some of the, the times for some of the men made their racism more overt or less covert or less overt. Uh, excuse me. But they were all racist. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, this this question also forces people to get to the root to this question of have black lives ever mattered. Uh, It forces people to grapple with uh, the racism that uh, exists in the society, the racism that exists in this country and how many people the racism affects. And a lot of times people don't want to think that they are racist or admit that they are racist. And uh, I think that they think that uh, it's a it, it can, it's a condemnation, and uh, in my opinion, it's not a condemnation to be uh, to be racist. You're not condemned to be racist, but you must acknowledge that this society breeds people uh, who are uh, not of color to be racist, and it breeds people who are of color to a lot of times who have self hatred or to have anti uh, black or anti brown feelings and sentiments. Uh, about things and a lot of times it's subconscious you know that's why we have to do the work of uh, of raising the consciousness of of highlighting the hypocrisies of of trying to uh, uh, highlight the issues because of how uh, deeply ingrained it is into society and how it can just how much of it is just subconscious and uh, and so that, that's some of the those are all some of my takeaways from uh, this first 
part of the reading. And I think one of the other things as well is the transition to pointing out how all of this history has led to these police forces that exist in the North and in the West uh, enacting some of the same things that uh, were the ideolo ideologically originate from the South. Uh, and how no matter where you go in this country, you cannot escape racism. Okay. Uh, episode one in the books. Rafford Reading. Have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Go listen to episode two.